What do you picture when you think about the security field? This might make you think of a dark room with people hunched over their computers. Maybe you picture a person in a lab carefully analyzing evidence. Or maybe you imagine a guard standing watch in front of a building. The truth is, no matter what thoughts cross your mind, all of these examples are part of the wide world of security. Hi, my name is Dequisha. I have worked as a security engineer for four years. I'm excited to be your instructor for this course and share some of my experience with you. At Google, I'm part of a diverse team of security professionals who all have different backgrounds and unique perspectives. For example, in my role, I work to secure Gmail. Part of my daily activities include developing new security features and fixing vulnerabilities in the application to make email safer for our users. Some members of my team began working in security after graduating for college. Many others found their way into the field after years of working in another industry. Security teams come in all different shapes and sizes. Each member of a team has a role to play. While our specific functions within the group differ, we all share the same objective, protecting valuable assets from harm. Accomplishing this mission involves a combination of people, processes, and tools. In this course, you'll learn about each of these in detail. First, you'll be introduced to the world of asset security. You'll learn about the variety of assets that organizations protect and how these factor into a company's overall approach to security. Then, you'll begin exploring the security systems and controls that teams use to proactively protect people and their information. All systems have weaknesses that can be approved upon. When those weaknesses are neglected or ignored, they can lead to serious problems. In this section of the course, you'll focus on common vulnerabilities and systems and the ways security teams stay ahead of potential problems. Finally, you'll learn about the threats to asset security. You'll also be introduced to the threat modeling process that security teams use to stay one step ahead of potential attacks. In this field, we try to do everything possible to avoid being put in a compromised position. By the end of this course, you'll have a clearer picture of the ways people, processes, and technology work together to protect all that's important. Throughout the course, you'll also get an idea of the exciting career opportunities available to you. Security truly is an interdisciplinary field. Your background and perspective is an asset. Whether you're a recent college graduate or starting a new career path, the security field presents a wide range of possibilities. So what do you say? Are you ready to go on this journey with me? We all depend on technology so much nowadays. Examples of this are all around us. Personal devices like smartphones help keep us in touch with friends and families across the globe. Wearable technologies help us achieve personal goals and be more productive. Businesses have also come to embrace technology in everyday life. From streamlining operations to automating processes, our world is more connected because of technology. The more we rely on technology, the more information we share. As a result, an enormous amount of data is created every day. This huge surge in data creation presents unique challenges. As businesses become more reliant on technology, cyber criminals become more sophisticated in how they affect organizations. Data breaches are becoming increasingly serious due to all the sensitive data businesses are storing. One positive aspect of these challenges is a growing need for individuals like you. Security is a team effort. Unique perspectives like yours are an asset to any organization. A team filled with diverse backgrounds, cultures, and experiences is more likely to solve problems and be innovative. As breach after breach hits the headlines, it's clear that organizations need more professionals focused on security. Companies around the globe are working hard to keep up with the demands of a rapidly changing digital landscape. As the environment continues to transform, the more your personal experience is valuable. In this section, we'll start by exploring how assets, threats, and vulnerabilities factor into security plans. After that, we'll discuss the use of asset inventories and in protecting the wide range of assets that companies have. Then, we'll consider the challenges in this rapidly changing digital world. And finally, you'll gain an understanding of the building blocks of a security plan, its policies, standards, and procedures. We'll examine the NIST cybersecurity framework that companies use to create security plans that protect their customers and their brands. I hope you're as excited to go on this journey into this world of security as I am. Now let's get started. Painting a portrait. 
perfecting a new basketball move, playing a solo on guitar. They all share something in common. Can you guess what it is? If you thought practice, you're absolutely correct. It takes time, dedication, and focus to improve these skills. The security profession is no different. Planning for the future is a core skill that you'll need to practice all the time in security. We all deal with uncertainty by trying to solve problems before they arise. For example, if you're going on a trip, you might think about the length of the trip and how much to pack. Maybe you're traveling somewhere cold. You might bring coats and sweaters to help keep you warm. We all want to feel the security of knowing that there's a plan if something goes wrong. Businesses are no different. Just like you, organizations try their best to plan ahead by analyzing risks. Security teams help companies by focusing on risks. In security, a risk is anything that can impact the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an asset. Our primary focus as security practitioners is to maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are the three components of the CIA triad. The process of security risk planning is the first step towards protecting these cornerstones. Each organization has their own unique security plan based on the risks they face. Thankfully, you don't need to be familiar with every possible security plan to be a good security practitioner. All you really need to know are the basis of how these plans are put together. Security plans are based on the analysis of three elements, assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. Organizations measure security risks by analyzing how each can have an effect on confidentiality, integrity, and availability of their information and systems. Basically, they each represent the what, why, and how of security. Let's spend a little time exploring each of these in more detail. As you might imagine, an asset is an item perceived as having value to an organization. This often includes a wide range of things. Buildings, equipment, data, and people are all examples of assets that businesses want to protect. Let's examine this idea more by analyzing the assets of a home. Inside a home, there's a wide range of assets, like people and personal belongings. The outside structure of a home is made of assets too, like the walls, roof, windows, and doors. All of these assets have value, but they differ in how they might be protected. Someone might place a lower priority on protecting the outside walls than on the front door, for example. This is because a burglar is more likely to enter through the front door than a wall. That's why we have locks. With so many types of assets to think of, security plans need to prioritize resources. After all, no matter how large a security team is, it would be impossible to monitor every single asset at all hours of the day. Security teams can prioritize their efforts based on threats. In security, a threat is any circumstance or event that can negatively impact assets. Much like assets, threats include a wide range of things. Going back to the example of a home, a threat can be a burglar who's trying to gain access. Burglars aren't the only type of threats that affect the security of windows and doors. What if either broke by accident? Strong winds can blow the door open during a bad storm, or kids playing with a ball nearby can accidentally damage a window. If any of these thoughts cross your mind, great job. You're already demonstrating a security mindset. The final element of a security plan that we're going to cover are vulnerabilities. In security, a vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by a threat. A wheat lock on a front door, for example, is a vulnerability that can be exploited by a burglar. And old crack wood is a different vulnerability on that same front door that can increase the chances of storm damage. In other words, think of vulnerabilities as flaws within an asset. Assets can have many different types of vulnerabilities that are an easy target for attackers. We'll explore different types of threats and vulnerabilities in greater detail later. For now, just understand that security teams need to account for a wide range of assets, threats, and vulnerabilities to effectively plan for the future. It can be really stressful when you have trouble finding something important. You're late to an appointment and can't find your keys. We all find ourselves in situations like these at one time or another. Believe it or not, organizations deal with the same kind of trouble. Take a few seconds to think of the number of important assets you have nearby. I'm thinking of my phone, wallet, and keys, for example. Next, imagine that you're just joined a security team for a small online retailer. The company has been growing over the past few years, adding more and more customers. 
As a result, they're expanding their security department to protect the increasing numbers of assets they have. Let's say each of you are responsible for 10 assets. That's a lot of assets. Even in the small business setting, that's an incredible amount of things that needs protecting. A fundamental truth of security is you can only protect the things you account for. Asset management is the process of tracking assets and the risk that affects them. All security plans revolve around asset management. Recall that assets include any item perceived as having value to an organization. Equipment, data, and intellectual property are just a few of the wide range of assets businesses want to protect. A critical part of every organization's security plan is keeping track of its assets. Asset management starts with having an asset inventory, a catalog of assets that need to be protected. This is an essential part of protecting organizational assets. Without this record, organizations run the risk of losing track of all that's important to them. A good way to think of asset inventories is as a shepherd protecting sheep. Having an accurate count of the number of sheep help in a lot of ways. For example, it would be easier to allocate resources like food to take care of them. Another benefit of asset inventory might be that you get an alert if one of them goes missing. Once more, think of the important assets you have nearby. Just like me, you're probably able to rate them according to the level of importance. I would rank my wallet ahead of my shoes, for example. In security, this practice is known as asset classification. In general, asset classification is the practice of labeling assets based on the sensitivity and importance to an organization. Organizations label assets differently. Many of them follow a basic classification scheme, public, internal only, confidential, and restricted. Public assets can be shared with anyone. Internal only can be shared with anyone in the organization, but should not be shared outside of it. And confidential assets should only be accessed by those working on a specific project. Assets classified as restricted are typically highly sensitive and must be protected. Assets with this label are considered need to know. Examples include intellectual property and health or payment information. For example, a growing online retailer might mark internal emails about a new product as confidential because those working on the new product should know about it. They might also label the doors at their offices with a restricted sign to keep everyone out who doesn't have a specific reason to be in there. These are just a couple of everyday examples that you may be familiar with from your prior experience. For the most part, classification determines whether an asset can be disclosed, altered, or destroyed. Asset management is a continuous process, one that helps uncover unexpected gaps in security for potential risks. Keeping track of all that's important to an organization is an essential part of security planning. Welcome back. We've covered a lot of information so far. I hope you're having as much fun exploring the world of security as I am. We've explored what organization assets are and why they need protection. You've also gotten a sense of the tremendous amount of asset security teams protect. Previously, we began examining security asset management and the importance of keeping track of everything that's important to an organization. Security teams classify assets based on value. Next, let's expand our security mindset and think about this question. What exactly is valuable about an asset? These days, the answer is often information. Most information is in a digital form. We call this data. Data is information that is translated, processed, or stored by a computer. We live in a connected world. Billions of devices around the world are linked to the internet and are exchanging data with each other all the time. In fact, millions of pieces of data are being passed to your device right now. When compared to physical assets, digital assets have additional challenges. What you will need to understand is that protecting data depends on where that data is and what it's doing. Security teams protect data in three different states, in use, in transit, and at rest. Let's investigate this idea in greater detail. Data in use is data being accessed by one or more users. Imagine being at a part with your laptop. It's a nice sunny day and you stop at a bench to check your email. This is an example of data in use. As soon as you log in, your inbox is considered to be in use. Next is data in transit. 
Data in transit is data traveling from one point to another. While you're signed into your account, a message from one of your friends appear. They sent you an interesting article about the growing security industry. You decide to reply, thanking them for sending this to you. When you click send, this is now an example of data in transit. Finally, there's data at rest. Data at rest is data not currently being accessed. In this state, data is typically stored on a physical device. An example of data at rest would be when you finish checking your email and close your laptop. You then decide to pack up and go to a nearby cafe for breakfast. As you make your way from the park towards the cafe, the data in your laptop is at rest. So now that we understand these states of data, let's connect this back to asset management. Earlier, I mentioned that information is one of the most valuable assets that companies can have. Information security, or InfoSec, is the practice of keeping data in all states away from unauthorized users. Weak information security is a serious problem. It can lead to things like identity theft, financial loss, and reputational damage. These events have potential to harm organizations, their partners, and their customers. And there's more to consider in your work as a security analyst. As our digital world continually changes, we are adapting our understanding of data at rest. Physical devices like our smartphones more commonly store data in the cloud, meaning that our information isn't necessarily at rest just because our phone is resting on a table. We should always be mindful of new vulnerabilities as our world becomes increasingly connected. Remember, protecting data depends on where the data is and what it's doing. Keeping track of information is part of the puzzle that companies solve when considering their security plan. Understanding the three states of data enables security teams to analyze risk and determine an asset management plan for different situations. Security is all about people, processes, and technology. It's a team effort, and I mean that literally. Protecting assets extends well beyond one person or a group of people in an IT department. The truth of the matter is that security is a culture. It's a shared set of values that spans all levels of an organization. These values touch everyone, from employees to vendors to customers. Protecting digital and physical assets requires everyone to participate, which can be a challenge. That's what security plans are for. Plans come in many shapes and sizes, but they all share a common goal, to be prepared for risks when they happen. Placing the focus on people is what leads to the most effective security plans. Considering the diverse backgrounds and perspectives of everyone involved ensure that no one is left out when something goes wrong. We talked earlier about the risks as being anything that can impact the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an asset. Most security plans address risks by breaking them down according to categories and factors. Some common risk categories might include the damage, disclosure, or loss of information. Any of these can be due to factors like the physical damage or malfunctions of a device. There are also factors like attacks and human error. For example, a new school teacher may be asked to sign a contract before their first day of class. The agreement may warn against some common risks associated with human error, like using a personal email to send sensitive information. A security plan may require that all new hires sign off on this agreement, effectively spreading the values that ensure everyone's in alignment. This is just one example of the types and causes of risks that a plan might address. These things vary widely depending on the company, but how these plans are communicated is similar across industries. Security plans consist of three basic elements policies, standards, and procedures. These three elements are how companies share their security plans. These words tend to be used interchangeably outside of security, but you'll soon discover that they each have a very specific meaning and function in this context. A policy in security is a set of rules that reduce risks and protects information. Policies are the foundation of every security plan. They give everyone in and out of an organization guidance by addressing questions like, what are we protecting and why? Policies focus on the strategic side of things by identifying the scope, objectives, and limitations of a security plan. For instance, newly hired employees at many companies are required to sign off on an acceptable use policy, or AUP. These provisions outline secure ways that an employee may access corporate systems. Standards are the next part. 
These have a tactical function as they concern how well we're protecting assets. In security, standards are references that inform how to set policies. A good way to think of standards is that they create a point of reference. For example, many companies use the password management standard identified in NIST Special Publication 800-63B to improve their security policies by specifying that employees' passwords must be at least eight characters long. The last part of a plan is its procedures. Procedures are step-by-step -step instructions to perform a specific security task. Organizations usually keep multiple procedure documents that are used throughout the company, like how employees can choose secure passwords or how they can securely reset a password if it's been locked. Sharing clear and actionable procedures with everyone creates accountability, consistency, and efficiency across an organization. Policies, standards, and procedures vary widely from one company to another because they are tailored to each organization's goals. Simply understanding the structure of security plans is a great start. For now, I hope you have a clearer picture of what policies, standards, and procedures are and how they are essential to making security a team effort. Having a plan is just one part of securing assets. Once the plan is in action, the other part is making sure everyone's following along. In security, we call this compliance. Compliance is the process of adhering to internal standards and external regulations. Small companies and large organizations around the world place security compliance at the top of their list of priorities. At a high level, maintaining trust, reputation, safety, and the integrity of your data are just a few reasons to be concerned about compliance. Fines, penalties, and lawsuits are other reasons. This is particularly true for companies in highly regulated industries like healthcare, energy, and finance. Being out of compliance with a regulation can cause long-lasting financial and reputational effects that can seriously impact a business. Regulations are rules set by a government or other authority to control the way something is done. Like policies, regulations exist to protect people and their information but on a larger scale. Compliance can be a complex process because of the many regulations that exist all around the world. For our purpose, we're going to focus on a framework of security compliance, the US-based NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Early in the program, you learned the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. One of the primary roles of NIST is to openly provide companies with a set of frameworks and security standards that reflect key security-related regulations. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework is a voluntary framework that consists of standards, guidelines, and best practices to manage cybersecurity risks. Commonly known as the CSF, this framework was developed to help businesses secure one of their most important assets, information. The CSF consists of three main components, the core, its tiers, and its profiles. Let's explore each of these together to build a better understanding of how NIST CSF is used. The core is basically a simplified version of the functions or duties of a security plan. The CSF core identifies five broad functions. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Think of these categories of the core as a security checklist. After the core, the next NIST component we'll discuss is its tiers. These provide security teams with a way to measure performance across each of the five functions of the core. Tiers range from level one to level four. Level one, or passive, indicates a function is reaching bare minimum standards. Level four, or adaptive, is an indication that a function is being performed at a exemplary standard. You may have noticed that CSF tiers aren't a yes or no proposition. Instead, there's a range of values. That's because tiers are designed as a way of showing organization what is and isn't working with their security plans. Lastly, profiles are the final component of CSF. These provide insight into the current state of a security plan. One way to think of profiles is like photos capturing a moment in time. Comparing photos of the same subject taken at different times can provide useful insights. For example, Without these photos, you might not notice how this tree has changed. It's the same with NIST profiles. Good security practice is about more than avoiding fines and attacks. 
It demonstrates that you care about people and their information. Before we go, let's visit the course functions one more time to look at where we've been and where we're going. The first function is identify. Our previous discussions on asset management and risk assessment relates to that function. Coming up, we're going to focus on many of the categories of the second function, the protect function. Meet you there. Well done. You made it to the end of this section. Being a security practitioner takes commitment and a desire to learn. A big part of the job involves keeping current with best practices and emerging trends. Thinking back on my own journey into the world of security, I'm so proud of you for your continued commitment. We've covered a lot of material this week, and this is a good time to reflect and look back on the key concepts we explored together. We covered the building blocks of organizational risk management, assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. We also spent some time demonstrating the importance of asset inventories. It's much easier to protect companies' assets if you know where they are and who's responsible for them. After that, we moved on to explore the challenges in a rapidly changing digital world. Part of protecting data in this world is understanding if it's in use, in transit, or at rest. Finally, in our high-level exploration of policies, standards, and procedures, we talked about how each of them factor into achieving security goals. There is no one-size-fit-all approach to achieving security. While exploring the NIST cybersecurity framework, you gained an appreciation of how it supports good security practices. Attackers are also constantly building their skills and finding new ways to break through the defenses we put up. Remember, the landscape is always changing. There's always more to learn if you want to be a good security practitioner. Next up, we're going to expand our security mindset by learning more about the different systems security teams use to protect organizational assets. I'm looking forward to it. I was fascinated by a worldwide malware event that happened in 2017. I started watching videos and preparing to take certification tests just like you. I felt overwhelmed at first, but my curiosity and passion has driven me to continue learning in this field. I always remind myself that no one is born knowing everything and everyone is on a learning journey. Even now, I still remember what it was like to start out in this profession. So believe me when I tell you that you're making great progress and I am proud of your effort. Now, before looking ahead to where we're headed on our journey into the world of security, let's take a moment to look back on where we've been. Previously, we focused mostly on the concept of assets and risks in security. We covered topics like the importance of managing assets and keeping them safe. We discussed how the digital world presents new challenges and opportunities in the field of security. We also spent some time exploring security plans. With this solid foundation, we're ready to keep expanding our security mindset. In this section, we'll cover the security controls that are used to proactively keep assets safe. I use the word proactively there on purpose. As you'll soon discover, these controls are the protections that we put in place to stop problems before they happen. We're going to begin by taking an in-depth look at privacy. Here, you'll learn about the effective data handling processes that keep information safe. Next, you'll explore the role of encryption and hashing in safeguarding information. Finally, you'll learn about the standard access controls that companies use to authorize and authenticate users. All right. Are you ready to keep moving ahead? I know I am. These days, information is in so many places at once. As a result, organizations are under a lot of pressure to implement effective security controls that protects everyone's information from being stolen or exposed. Security controls are safeguards designed to reduce specific security risks. They include a wide range of tools that protect assets before, during, and after an event. Security controls can be organized into three types, technical, operational, and managerial. Technical control types include the many technologies used to protect assets. This includes encryption, authentication systems, and others. Operational controls relate to maintaining the day-to-day -day security environment. Generally, people perform these controls, like awareness training and incident response. Managerial controls are centered around how the other two reduce risks. Examples of management controls include policies, standards, and procedures. Typically, an organization's security policy outlines the controls needed to achieve their goals. Information privacy plays a key role in these decisions. 
Information privacy is the protection of unauthorized access and distribution of data. Information privacy is about the right to choose. People and organizations alike deserve the right to decide when, how, and to what extent private information about them is shared. Security controls are the technologies used to regulate information privacy. For example, imagine using a travel app to book a flight. You might browse through a list of flights and find one at a good price. To reserve a seat, you enter some personal information, like your name, email, and credit card number for payment. The transaction goes through successfully, and you've booked your flight. Now, you reasonably expect the airline company to access this information you enter when signing up to complete the reservation. However, should everyone at the company have access to your information? A person working in the marketing department shouldn't need access to your credit card information. It makes sense to share that information with a customer support agent, except they should only need to access it while helping with your reservation. To maintain privacy, security controls are intended to limit access based on the user and situation. This is known as the principle of least privilege. Security controls should be designed with the principle of least privilege in mind. When they are, they rely on differentiating between data owners and data custodians. A data owner is a person who decides who can access, edit, use, or destroy their information. The idea is very straightforward, except in cases where there are multiple owners. For example, the intellectual property of an organization can have multiple data owners. A data custodian is anyone or anything that's responsible for the safe handling, transport, and storage of information. Did you notice that I mentioned anything? That's because, aside from people, organizations and their systems are also custodians of people's information. There are other considerations besides these when implementing security controls. Remember that data is an asset. Like any other asset, information privacy requires proper classification and handling. As we progress in this section, we'll continue exploring other security controls that make this possible. The internet is an open public system with a lot of data flowing through it. Even though we all send and store information online, there's some information that we choose to keep private. In security, this type of data is known as personally identifiable information. Personally identifiable information, or PII, is any information that can be used to infer an individual's identity. This can include things like someone's name, medical and financial information, photos, emails, or fingerprints. Maintaining the privacy of PII online is difficult. It takes the right security controls to do so. One of the main security controls used to protect information online is cryptography. Cryptography is the process of transforming information into a form that unintended readers can't understand. Data of any kind is kept secret using a two-step process, encryption to hide the information and decryption to unhide it. Imagine sending an email to a friend. The process starts by taking data in its original and readable form, known as plain text. Encryption takes that information and scrambles it into an unreadable form known as ciphertext. We then use decryption to unscramble the ciphertext back into plain text form, making it readable again. Hiding and unhiding private information is a practice that's been around for a long time, way before computers. One of the earliest cryptographic methods is known as Caesar's cipher. This method is named after a Roman general, Julius Caesar, who ruled the Roman Empire near the end of the first century BC. He used it to keep messages between him and his military generals private. Caesar's cipher is a pretty simple algorithm that works by shifting letters in the Roman alphabet forward by a fixed number of spaces. An algorithm is a set of rules that solve a problem. Specifically, in cryptography, a cipher is an algorithm that encrypts information. For example, a message encoded with Caesar's cipher using a shift of three would encode an A as a D, an A B as an E, a C as an F, and so on. In this example, you could send a friend a message that said hello using a shift of three, and it would read K-H-O-O-R. Now, you might be wondering, how would you know the shift a message encrypted with Caesar's cipher is using? The answer to that is, you need the key. 
A cryptographic key is a mechanism that decrypts ciphertext. In our example, the key would tell you that my message is encrypted by three shifts. With that information, you can unlock the hidden message. Every form of encryption relies on both a cipher and key to secure the exchange of information. Caesar's cipher is not widely used today because of a couple of major flaws. One concerns the cipher itself. The other relates to the key. This particular cipher relies entirely on the characters of the Roman alphabet to hide information. For example, consider a message written using the English alphabet, which is only 26 characters. Even without the key, it's pretty simple to crack a message secured with Caesar's cipher by shifting letters 26 different ways. In information security, this tactic is known as brute force attack, a trial and error process of discovering private information. The other major flaw of Caesar's cipher is that it relies on a single key. If that key was lost or stolen, there's nothing stopping someone from accessing private information. Properly keeping track of cryptographic keys is an important part of security. To start, it's important to ensure that these keys are not stored in public places and to share them separately from the information they will decrypt. Caesar's cipher is just one of many algorithms used to protect people's privacy. Due to its limitations, we rely on more complex algorithms to secure information online. Our next focus is exploring how modern algorithms work to keep information private. Computers use a lot of encryption algorithms to send and store information online. They're all helpful when it comes to hiding private information but only as long as their keys are protected. Can you imagine having to keep track of the encryption keys protecting all of your personal information online? Neither can I. And we don't have to, thanks to something known as public key infrastructure. Public key infrastructure, or PKI, is an encryption framework that secures the exchange of information online. It's a broad system that makes accessing information fast, easy, and secure. So how does it all work? PKI is a two-step process. It all starts with the exchange of encrypted information. This involves either asymmetric encryption, symmetric encryption, or both. Asymmetric encryption involves the use of a public and private key pair for encryption and decryption of data. Let's imagine this as a box that can be opened with two keys. One key, the public key, can only be used to access the slot and add items to the box. Since the public key can't be used to remove items, it can be copied and shared with people all around the world to add items. On the other hand, the second key, the private key, opens the box fully so that the items inside can be removed. Only the owner of the box have access to the private key that unlocks it. Using a public key allows the people and servers you're communicating with to see and send you encrypted information that only you can decrypt with your private key. This two-key system makes asymmetric encryption a secure way to exchange information online. However, it also slows down the process. Symmetric encryption, on the other hand, is a faster and simpler approach to key management. Symmetric encryption involves the use of a single secret key to exchange information. Let's imagine the locked box again. Instead of two keys, symmetric encryption uses the same key. The owner can use it to open the box add items, and close it again. When they want to share access, they can give the secret key to anyone else to do the same. Exchanging a single secret key may make web communications faster, but it also makes it less secure. PKI uses both asymmetric and symmetric encryption, sometimes in conjunction with one another. It all depends on whether speed or security is the priority. For example, Mobile chat applications use asymmetric encryption to establish a connection between people at the start of a conversation when security is the priority. Afterwards, when the speed of communications back and forth is the priority, symmetric encryption takes over. While both have their own strengths and weaknesses, they share a common vulnerability, establishing trust between the sender and receiver. Both processes rely on sharing keys that can be misused, lost, or stolen. This isn't a problem when we exchange information in person because we can use our senses to tell the difference between those we trust and those we don't trust. Computers, on the other hand, aren't naturally equipped to make this distinction. That's where the second step of PKI applies. 
PKI addresses the vulnerability of key sharing by establishing trust using a system of digital certificates between computers and networks. A digital certificate is a file that verifies the identity of a public key holder. Most online information is exchanged using digital certificates. Users, companies, and networks hold one and exchange them when communicating information online as a way of signaling trust. Let's look at an example of how digital certificates are created. Let's say an online business is about to launch their website and they want to obtain a digital certificate. When they register their domain, the hosting company sends certain information over to a trusted certificate authority, or CA. The information provided is usually basic things like the company name and the country where its headquarters are located. A public key for the site is also provided. The certificate authority then uses this data to verify the company's identity. When it's confirmed, the CA encrypts the data with its own private key. Finally, they create a digital certificate that contains the encrypted company data. It also contains CA digital signature to prove that it's authentic. Digital certificates are a lot like a digital ID badge that's used online to restrict or grant access to information. This is how PKI solves the trust issue. Combined with asymmetric and symmetric encryption, this two-step approach to exchanging secure information between trusted sources is what makes PKI such a useful security control. Security professionals are always thinking about vulnerabilities. It's how we stay ahead of threats. We spent some time together exploring a couple forms of encryption. The two types we've discussed produce keys that are shared when communicating information. Encryption keys are vulnerable to being lost or stolen, which can lead to sensitive information at risk. Let's explore another security control that helps companies address this weakness. A hash function is an algorithm that produces a code that can't be decrypted. Unlike asymmetric and symmetric algorithms, hash functions are one-way processes that do not generate decryption keys. Instead, these algorithms produce a unique identifier known as a hash value or digest. Here's an example to demonstrate this. Imagine a company has an internal application that is used by employees and is stored in a shared drive. After passing through a hashing function, the program receives its hash value. For example purposes, we created this relatively short hash value with the MD5 hashing function. Generally, standard hash functions that produce longer hashes are preferred for being more secure. Next, Let's imagine an attacker replaces the program with a modified version that performs malicious actions. The malicious program may work like the original. However, if so much as one line of code is different from the original, it will produce a different hash value. By comparing the hash values, we can validate that the programs are different. Attackers use tricks like this often because they're easily overlooked. Fortunately, Hash values help us identify when something like this is happening. In security, hashes are primarily used as a way to determine the integrity of files and applications. Data integrity relates to the accuracy and consistency of information. This is known as non-repudiation, the concept that authenticity of information can't be denied. Hash functions are important security controls that make proven data integrity possible. Analysts use them frequently. One way to do this is by finding the hash value of files or applications and comparing them against known malicious files. For example, we can use the Linux command line to generate the hash value for any file on your computer. We just launch the shell and type the name of the hashing algorithm we want to use. In this case, we're using a common one known as SHA-256. Next, we need to enter the file name of any file we want to hash. Let's hash the contents of newfile.txt. Now, we'll press Enter. The terminal generates this unique hash value for the file. These tools can be compared with the hash values of known online viruses. One such database is VirusTotal. This is a popular tool among security practitioners that's useful for analyzing suspicious files, domains, IPs, and URLs. As we've explored, even the slightest change in input results in a totally different hash value. Hash functions are intentionally designed this way to assist with matters of non-repudiation. They equip computers with a quick and easy way to compare input and output values and validate data integrity. Pretty cool, right?
Protecting data is a fundamental feature of security controls. When it comes to keeping information safe and secure, hashing and encryption are powerful yet limited tools. Managing who or what has access to information is also key to safeguarding information. The next series of controls that we'll be exploring are access controls. The security controls that manage access, authorization, and accountability of information. When done well, access controls maintain data confidentiality, integrity, and availability. They also get users the information they need quickly. These systems are commonly broken down into three separate yet related functions known as the authentication, authorization, and accounting framework. Each control has its own protocol and systems that make them work. In this video, let's get comfortable with the basics of the first one on the list, authentication. Authentication systems are access controls that serve a very basic purpose. They ask anything attempting to access information this simple question, who are you? Organizations go about collecting answers to these questions differently, depending on the objectives of their security policy. Some are more thorough than others, but in general, responses to this question can be based on three factors of authentication. The first is knowledge. Authentication by knowledge refers to something the user knows, like a password or the answer to a security question they provided previously. Another factor is ownership, referring to something the user possesses. A commonly used type of authentication by ownership is a one-time passcode, or OTP. You've probably experienced these at one time or another. They're a random number sequence that an application or website will send you via text or email and ask you to provide. Last is characteristic. Authentication by this factor is something the user is. Biometrics, like fingerprint scans on your smartphone, are an example of this type of authentication. While not used everywhere, this form of authentication is becoming more common because it's much tougher for criminals to impersonate someone if they have to mimic a fingerprint or facial scan as opposed to a password. The information provided during authentication needs to match the information on file for these access controls to work. When the credentials don't match, authentication fails and access is denied. When they match, access is granted. Incorrectly denying access can be frustrating to anyone. To make access systems more convenient, many organizations these days rely on single sign-on. Single sign-on, or SSO, is a technology that combines several different logins into one. Can you imagine having to reintroduce yourself every time you meet up with a friend? That's exactly the sort of problem SSO solves. Instead of requiring users to authenticate over and over again, SSO establishes their identity once, allowing them to gain access to company resources faster. While SSO systems are helpful when it comes to speeding up the authentication process, they present a significant vulnerability when used alone. Denying access to authorized users can be frustrating, but you know what's even worse? Incorrectly granting access to the wrong user. SSO technology is great, but not if it relies on just a single factor of authentication. Adding more authentication factors strengthen these systems. Multi-factor authentication, or MFA, is a security measure which requires a user to verify their identity in two or more ways to access a system or network. MFA combines two or more independent credentials, like knowledge and ownership, to prove that someone is who they claim to be. SSO and MFA are often used in conjunction with one another to layer the defense capabilities of authentication systems. When both are used, organizations can ensure convenient access that is also secure. Now that we cover authentication, we're ready to explore the second part of the framework. Next, we'll learn about authorization. Access is as much about authorization as it is about authentication. One of the most important functions of access controls is how they assign responsibility for certain systems and processes. Next up in our exploration of access control systems are the mechanisms of authorization. These protocols actually work closely together with authentication technologies. While one validates who the user is, the other determines what they're allowed to do. Let's take a look at the next part of authentication, authorization, and accounting framework that protects private information. Earlier, we learned about the principle of least privilege. Authorization is linked to the idea that access to information only lasts as long as needed. 
Authorization systems are also heavily influenced by this idea, in addition to another important security principle, the separation of duties. Separation of duties is the principle that users should not be given levels of authorization that will allow them to misuse a system. Separating duties reduces the risk of system failures and inappropriate behavior from users. For example, a person responsible for providing customer service shouldn't also be authorized to rate their own performance. In this position, they could easily neglect their duties while continuing to give themselves high marks with no oversight. Similarly, if one person was authorized to develop and test a security system, they're much more likely to be unaware of its weaknesses. Both the principle of least privilege and the concept of separating duties apply to more than just people. They apply to all systems, including networks, databases, processes, and any other aspect of an organization. Ultimately, authorization depends on a system or user's role. When it comes to securing data over a network, there are a couple of frequently used access controls that you should be familiar with. HTTP basic auth and OAuth. Have you ever wondered what the HTTP and web addresses stood for? It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is how communications are established over a network. HTTP uses what is known as basic auth, the technology used to establish a user's request to access a server. Basic auth works by sending an identifier every time a user communicates with a web page. Some websites still use basic auth to tell whether or not someone is authorized to access information on that site. However, the protocol is considered to be vulnerable to attacks because it transmits usernames and password openly over the network. Most websites today use HTTPS instead, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. This protocol doesn't expose sensitive information like access credentials when communicating over the network. Another secure authentication technology used today is OAuth. OAuth is an open standard authorization protocol that shares designated access between applications. For example, you can tell Google that it's okay for another website to access your profile to create an account. Instead of requesting and sending sensitive usernames and passwords over the network, OAuth uses API tokens to verify access between you and a service provider. An API token is a small block of encrypted code that contains information about a user. These tokens contain things like your identity, site permissions, and more. OAuth sends and receives access requests using API tokens by passing them from a server to a user's device. Let's explore what's going on behind the scenes. When you authorize a site to create an account using your Google profile, all of Google's usual login protocols are still active. If you have multi-factor authentication enabled on your account, and you should, you'll still have the security benefits that it provides. API tokens minimize risk in a major way. These API tokens serve as an additional layer of encryption that helps to keep your Google password safe in the event of a breach on another platform. Basic Auth and OAuth are just a couple examples of authorization tools that are designed with the principles of least privilege and separation of duty in mind. There are many other controls that help limit the risk of unauthorized access to information. In addition to controlling access, it's also important to monitor it. In our next video, we'll focus on the third and final part of the authentication, authorization, and accounting framework. Have you ever wondered if your employer is keeping a record or when you log into company systems? Well, they are if they're implementing the third and final function of the authentication, authorization, and accounting framework. Accounting is the practice of monitoring the access logs of a system. These logs contain information like who accessed the system and when they accessed it and what resources they use. Security analysts use access logs a lot. The data they contain is a helpful way to identify trends like failed login attempts. They also use to uncover hackers who have gained access to a system and for detecting an incident like a data breach. In this field, access logs are essential. Oftentimes, analyzing them is the first procedure you'll follow when investigating a security event. So how do access logs compile all this useful information? Let's examine this more closely. Anytime a user accesses a system, they initiate what's called a session. A session is a sequence of network HTTP basic auth requests and responses associated with the same user. 
like when you visit a website. Access logs are essentially records of sessions that capture the moment a user enters a system and to the moment they leave it. Two actions are triggered when the session begins. The first is the creation of a session ID. A session ID is a unique token that identifies a user and their device while accessing the system. Session IDs are attached to the user until they either close their browser or the session times out. The second action that takes place at the start of a session is an exchange of session cookies between the server and a user's device. A session cookie is a token that websites use to validate a session and determine how long that session should last. When cookies are exchanged between your computer and a server, your session ID is read to determine what information the website should show you. Cookies make web sessions safer and more efficient. The exchange of tokens mean that no sensitive information like usernames and passwords are shared. Session cookies prevent attackers from obtaining sensitive data. However, there's other damage that they can do. With a stolen cookie, an attacker can impersonate a user using their session token. This kind of attack is known as session hijacking. Session hijacking is an event when attackers obtain a legitimate user's session ID. During these kinds of attacks, cyber criminals impersonate the user, causing all sorts of harm. Money or private data can be stolen. If, for example, hijackers obtain a single sign-on credential from stolen cookies, they can even gain access to additional systems that otherwise seem secure. This is one reason why accounting and monitoring session logs is so important. Unusual activity on an access log can be an indication that information has been improperly accessed or stolen. At the end of the day, accounting is how we gain valuable insight that makes information safer. Our focus in this section was on a major theme of security, protecting assets. A large part of this relates to privacy. We should all enjoy the right to decide who can access our information. As we learn, there are several controls in place that help secure assets. We begin the section by exploring effective data handling processes that are found on the principle of least privilege. We then explored the role of encryption and hashing and safeguarding information. We explored how symmetric and asymmetric encryption works and how hashes further safeguard data from harm. We then turned our attention to standard access controls. Properly authenticating and authorizing users is what maintaining the CIA triad of information is all about. We use the AAA framework of security to take a detailed tour of identity and access management systems and the access controls that validate whether or not someone is who they claim to be. Well done making it through the first half of the course. You're making great progress so far, and I hope you keep it up. Remember, your background and experiences are valuable in this field. This, combined with the concepts we're covering, will make you a valuable contributor to any security team. Up until this point, we've been exploring the defensive side of security. But security isn't all about planning ahead and waiting for something to happen. In the next part of our journey, we're going to continue developing a security mindset by taking a more proactive look at security from the perspective of attackers. I'll meet you there. Wow, we've covered a lot together. It's hard to believe we've reached the midpoint of this course. I hope you're getting a clearer picture of this exciting field and all the opportunities it has to offer. And most importantly, I hope you're having fun doing it. We've come a long ways from where we started. When we began our journey together, we were introduced to the three building blocks of every security program, assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. We focused a lot on assets early on and the wide range of things security professionals work to protect. We then turned our attention to a core component of asset security, protecting assets. You learned about the importance of guarding sensitive information. You also learned about some security controls that protect information from being lost or stolen. On the next part of our journey, we're going to turn our focus to vulnerabilities. Every asset we protect has a series of vulnerabilities or flaws that we need to be aware of. Staying informed of these things is a critical part of protecting people and organizations from harm. In this next part of the course, you will gain an understanding of the vulnerability management process. First, you will explore a common approach to vulnerability management, the defense in depth model. Then you will learn about how vulnerabilities are documented in online libraries like the CVE list. We'll discuss the attack surfaces security teams protect. And lastly, 
You will expand your attacker mindset by exploring the common attack vectors cyber criminals try to exploit. Security analysts play an important role in identifying and correcting vulnerabilities in systems. I know I'm excited to keep exploring. Are you? Then let's go. For every asset that needs protecting, there are dozens of vulnerabilities. Finding those vulnerabilities and fixing them before they become a problem is the key to keeping assets safe. We've already covered what a vulnerability is. Recall that a vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by a threat. That word can is an important part of this description. Why is that? Let's explore that together to find out more. Imagine I handed you an important document and asked you to keep it safe. How would you do that? Some of you might first think about locking it up in a safe place. Behind this is the understanding that because documents can be easily moved, they are vulnerable to theft. When other vulnerabilities come to mind, like how paper burns easily or doesn't resist water, you might add other protections. Similar to this example, security teams plan to protect assets according to their vulnerabilities and how they can be exploited. In security, an exploit is a way of taking advantage of a vulnerability. Besides finding vulnerabilities, security planning relies a lot on thinking of exploits. For example, there are burglars out there who want to cause harm. Homes have vulnerable systems that can be exploited by a burglar. An example are the windows. Glass is vulnerable to being broken. A burglar can exploit this vulnerability by using a rock to break the window. Thinking of this vulnerability and exploit ahead of time allows us to plan ahead. We can have an alarm system in place to scare the burglar away and alert the police. Security teams spend a lot of time finding vulnerabilities and thinking of how they can be exploited. They do this with a process known as vulnerability management. Vulnerability management is the process of finding and patching vulnerabilities. Vulnerability management helps keep assets safe. It's a method of stopping threats before they can become a problem. Vulnerability management is a four-step process. The first step is to identify vulnerabilities. The next step is to consider potential exploits of those vulnerabilities. Third is to prepare defenses against threats. And finally, the fourth step is to evaluate those defenses. When the last step ends, the process starts again. Vulnerability management happens in a cycle. It's a regular part of what security teams do because there are always new vulnerabilities to be concerned about. This is exactly why a diverse set of perspectives is useful. Having a wide range of backgrounds and experiences only strengthens security teams and their ability to find exploits. However, even large and diverse security teams can't keep track of everything. New vulnerabilities are constantly being discovered. These are known as zero-day exploits. A zero-day is an exploit that was previously unknown. The term zero-day refers to the fact that the exploit is happening in real time with zero days to fix it. These kind of exploits are dangerous. They represent threats that haven't been planned for yet. For example, we can anticipate the possibility of a burglar breaking into our home. We can plan for this type of threat by having defenses in place, like locks on the doors and windows. A zero-day exploit would be something totally unexpected, like the lock on the door falling off from intense heat. Zero-day exploits are things that don't normally come to mind. For example, this might be a new form of spyware infecting a popular website. When zero-day exploits happen, they can leave assets even more vulnerable to threats than they already are. Vulnerability management is the process of finding vulnerabilities and fixing their exploits. That's why the process is performed regularly at most organizations. Perhaps the most important step of the process is identifying vulnerabilities. We'll explore this step in more details next time we get together. I'll meet you again then. A layered defense is difficult to penetrate. When one barrier fails, another takes its place to stop an attack. Defense in depth is a security model that makes use of this concept. It's a layered approach to vulnerability management that reduces risk. Defense in depth is commonly referred to as the castle approach because it resembles the layered defenses of a castle. In the Middle Ages, these structures were very difficult to penetrate. They featured different defenses each unique in its design that posed different challenges for attackers. For example, a water-filled barrier called a moat 
usually formed a circle around the castle, preventing threats like large groups of attackers from reaching the castle walls. The few soldiers that made it past the first layer of defense were then faced with a new challenge, giant stone walls. A vulnerability of these structures was that they could be climbed. If attackers tried exploiting that weakness, guess what? They were met with another layer of defense, watchtowers filled with defenders ready to shoot arrows and keep them from climbing. Each level of defense of these medieval structures minimized the risk of attacks by identifying vulnerabilities and implementing a security control should one system fail. Defense in depth works in a similar way. The defense in depth concept can be used to protect any asset. It's mainly used in cybersecurity to protect information using a five layer design. Each layer features a number of security controls that protect information as it travels in and out of the model. The first layer of defense in depth is the perimeter layer. This layer includes some technologies that we've already explored, like usernames and passwords. Mainly, this is a user authentication layer that filters external access. Its function is to only allow access to trusted partners to reach the next layer of defense. Second, the network layer is more closely aligned with authorization. The network layer is made up of other technologies like network firewalls and others. Next is the endpoint layer. Endpoints refer to the devices that have access on a network. They could be devices like a laptop, desktop, or a server. Some examples of technologies that protect these devices are antivirus software. After that, we get to the application layer. This includes all the interfaces that are used to interact with technology. At this layer, security measures are programmed as part of an application. One common example is multi-factor authentication. You may be familiar with having to enter both your password and a code sent by SMS. This is part of the application layer of defense. And finally, the fifth layer of defense is the data layer. At this layer, we've arrived at the critical data that must be protected, like personally identifiable information. One security control that is important here in this final layer of defense is assets classification. Like I mentioned earlier, information passes in and out of each of these five layers whenever it's exchanged over a network. There are many more security controls, aside from the few that I mentioned, that are part of the defense in depth model. A lot of businesses design their security systems using the defense in depth model. Understanding this framework hopefully gives you a better sense of how an organization's security controls work together to protect important assets. We've discussed before that security is a team effort. Did you know the group extends well beyond a single security team? Protecting information is a global effort. When it comes to vulnerabilities, there are actually online public libraries. Individuals and organizations use them to share and document common vulnerabilities and exposures. We've been focusing a lot on vulnerabilities. Exposures are similar, but they have a key difference. While a vulnerability is a weakness of a system, an exposure is a mistake that can be exploited by a threat. For example, imagine you're asked to protect an important document. Documents are vulnerable to being misplaced. If you laid the document down near an open window, it could be exposed to being blown away. One of the most popular libraries of vulnerabilities and exposures is the CVE list. The Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures list, or CVE list, is an openly accessible dictionary of known vulnerabilities and exposures. It is a popular resource. Many organizations use the CVE list to find ways to improve their defenses. The CVE list was originally created by MITRE Corporation in 1999. MITRE is a collection of nonprofit research and development centers. They're sponsored by the US government. Their focus is on improving security technologies around the world. The main purpose of the CVE list is to offer a standard way of identifying and categorizing known vulnerabilities and exposures. Most CVEs in the list are reported by independent researchers, technology vendors, and ethical hackers, but anyone can report one. Before a CVE can make it onto the CVE list, it first goes through a strict review process by a CVE numbering authority, 
or CNA. A CNA is an organization that volunteers to analyze and distribute information on eligible CVEs. All of these groups have an established record of researching vulnerabilities and demonstrating security advisory capabilities. When a vulnerability or exposure is reported to them, a rigorous testing process takes place. The CVE list tests four criteria that a vulnerability must have before it's assigned an ID. First, it must be independent of other issues. In other words, the vulnerability should be able to be fixed without having to fix something else. Second, it must be recognized as a potential security risk by whoever reports it. Third, the vulnerability must be submitted with supporting evidence. And finally, the reported vulnerability can only affect one code base, or in other words, only one program source code. For instance, the desktop version of Chrome may be vulnerable, but the Android application may not be. If the reported flaw passes all of these tests, it is assigned a CVE ID. Vulnerabilities added to the CVE list are often reviewed by other online vulnerability databases. These organizations put them through additional tests to reveal how significant the flaws are and to determine what kind of threat they pose. One of the most popular is the NIST National Vulnerabilities Database. The NIST National Vulnerabilities Database uses what's known as the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS, which is a measurement system that scores the severity of a vulnerability. Security teams use CVSS as a way of calculating the impact a vulnerability could have on a system. They also use them to determine how quickly a vulnerability should be patched. The NIST National Vulnerabilities Database provide a base score of CVEs on a scale of 0 to 10. Base scores reflect the moment a vulnerability is evaluated, so they don't change over time. In general, a CVSS that scores below a 4.0 is considered to be low risk and doesn't require immediate attention. However, Anything above a 9.0 is considered to be a critical risk to company assets that should be addressed right away. Security teams commonly use the CVE list and CVSS scores as part of their vulnerability management strategy. These references provide recommendations for prioritizing security fixes, like installing software updates before patches. Libraries like the CVE list help organizations answer questions. Is a vulnerability dangerous to our business? If so, how soon should we address it? These online libraries bring together diverse perspectives from across the world. Contributing to this effort is one of my favorite parts of working in this field. Keep gaining experience, and I hope you'll participate too. Our exploration of the vulnerability management process so far has been focused on a couple of topics. We've discussed how vulnerabilities influence the design of defenses. We've also talked about how common vulnerabilities are shared. A topic we've yet to cover is how vulnerabilities are found in the first place. Weaknesses and flaws are generally found during a vulnerability assessment. A vulnerability assessment is the internal review process of an organization's security systems. These assessments work similar to the process of identifying and categorizing vulnerabilities on the CVE list. The main difference is an organization's security team performs, evaluates, scores, and fixes them on their own. Security analysts play a key role throughout this process. Overall, the goal of a vulnerability assessment is to identify weak points and prevent attacks. They're also how security teams determine whether their security controls meet regulatory standards. Organizations perform vulnerability assessments a lot. Because companies have so many assets to protect, security teams sometimes need to select which areas to focus on through vulnerability assessments. Once they decide what to focus on, vulnerability assessments typically follow a four-step process. The first step is identification. Here, scanning tools and manual testing are used to find vulnerabilities. During the identification step, the goal is to understand the current state of a security system like taking a picture of it. A large number of findings usually appear after identification. The next step of the process is vulnerability analysis. During this step, each of the vulnerabilities that were identified are tested. 
Like being a digital detective, the goal of vulnerability analysis is to find the source of the problem. The third step of the process is risk assessment. During this step of the process, a score is assigned to each vulnerability. This score is assigned based on two factors, how severe the impact would be if the vulnerability were to be exploited and the likelihood of this happening. Vulnerabilities uncovered during the first two steps of this process often outnumber the people available to fix them. Risk assessments are a way of prioritizing resources to handle the vulnerabilities that need to be addressed based on their score. The fourth and final step of vulnerability assessment is remediation. It's during this step that the vulnerabilities that can impact the organization are addressed. Remediation occurs depending on the severity score assigned during the risk assessment step. This part of the process is normally a joint effort between the security staff and IT teams to come up with the best approach to fixing the vulnerabilities that were uncovered earlier. Examples of remediation steps might include things like enforcing new security procedures, updating operating systems, or implementing system patches. Vulnerability assessments are great for identifying the flaws of a system. Most organizations use them to search for problems before they happen. But how do we know where to search? When we get together again, we'll explore how companies figure this out. There's a wide range of vulnerabilities and systems that need to be found. Assessing those weaknesses is a time-consuming process. To position themselves ahead of threats and make the most of their limited resources, companies start by understanding the environment surrounding their operations. An important part of this is getting a sense of their attack surface. An attack surface is all the potential vulnerabilities that a threat actor could exploit. Analyzing the attack surface is usually the first thing security teams do. For example, imagine being part of a security team of an old castle. Your team would need to decide how to allocate resources to defenses. Giant walls, stone towers, and wooden gates are a few common security controls of these structures. While these are all designed to protect the assets inside from attacks, they don't exactly account for all the possibilities. What if the castle were near the ocean? If it were, these defenses would be vulnerable to long-range attacks by ship. A proper understanding of the attack surface would mean your security team equipped the castle with catapults that could deal with these kinds of threats. Modern organizations need to concern themselves with both a physical and digital attack surface. The physical attack surface is made up of people and their devices. This surface can be attacked from both inside and outside the organization, which makes it unique. For example, let's consider an unattended laptop in a public space, like a coffee shop. The person responsible for it walked away while sensitive company information was visible on the screen. This information is vulnerable to external threats, like a business competitor who can easily record the information and exploit it. An internal threat of this attack surface, on the other hand, is often angry employees. These employees might share an organization's private information on purpose. In general, the physical attack surface should be filled with obstacles that deter attacks from happening. We call this process security hardening. Security hardening is the process of strengthening a system to reduce its vulnerabilities and attack surface. In other words, hardening is the act of minimizing the attack surface by limiting its points of entry. We do this a lot in security because the smaller the attack surface, the easier it is to protect. In fact, some security controls that we've explored previously, like organization policies and access controls, are common ways that organizations harden their physical attack surface. The digital attack surface is a bit tougher to harden. The digital attack surface includes everything that's beyond an organization's firewall. In other words, it includes anything that connects to an organization online. In the past, organizations stored their data in a single location. This mainly consists of servers that were managed on site. Accessing the information stored on those servers required connecting to the network the workplace managed. These days, information is accessed outside of an organization's network because it's stored in the cloud. Information can be accessed from anywhere in the world. A person can be in one part of the world, fly to another place, and continue working, all while outside of their organization's network. 
Cloud computing has essentially expanded the digital attack surface. Quicker access to information is something we all benefit from, but it comes with a cost. Organizations of all sizes are under more pressure to defend against threats coming from different entry points. When we get together next time, we'll explore why this is such a challenge. To defend against attacks, organizations need to have more than just the understanding of the growing digital landscape around them. Positioning themselves ahead of a cyber threat also takes understanding the type of attacks that can be used against them. Last time, we began exploring how the cloud has expanded the digital attack surface that organizations protect. As a result, cloud computing has led to an increase in the number of attack vectors available. Attack vectors refer to the pathways attackers use to penetrate security defenses. Like the doors and windows of a home, these pathways are the exploitable features of an attack surface. One example of an attack vector would be social media. Another would be removable media, like a USB drive. Most people outside of security assume that cyber criminals are the only ones out there exploiting attack vectors. While attack vectors are used by malicious hackers to steal information, other groups use them too. For example, employees occasionally exploit attack vectors unintentionally. This happens a lot with social media platforms. Sometimes employees post sensitive company news that shouldn't have been shared. At times, this same kind of thing happens on purpose. Social media platforms are also vectors that disgruntled employees use to intentionally share confidential information that can harm the company. We all treat attack vectors as critical risks to asset security. Attackers typically put forward a lot of effort planning their attacks before carrying them out. It's up to us as security professionals to put an even greater amount of effort into stopping them. Security teams do this by thinking of each vector with an attacker mindset. This starts with a simple question. How would we exploit this vector? We then go through a step-by-step -step process to answer our question. First, when practicing an attacker mindset, we identify a target. This could be specific information, a system, a person, a group, or the organization itself. Next, we determine how the target can be accessed. What information is available that an attacker might take advantage of to reach the target? Based on that information, the third step is to evaluate the attack vectors that can be exploited to gain entry. And finally, we find the tools and methods of attack. What will the attackers use to carry this out? Along the way, practicing an attacker mindset provides valuable insight into the best security controls to implement and the vulnerabilities that need to be monitored. Every organization has a long list of attack vectors to defend. And while there are a lot of ways to protect them, there are a few common rules for doing this. One key to defending attack vectors is educating users about security vulnerabilities. These efforts are usually tied to an event. For example, advising them about a new phishing exploit that is targeting users in the organization. Another rule is applying the principle of least privilege. We've explored least privilege earlier in this section. It's the idea that access rights should be limited to what's required to perform a task. Like we previously explored, this practice closes multiple security holes inside an organization's attack surface. Next, using the right security controls and tools can go a long way towards defending attack vectors. Even the most knowledgeable employees make security mistakes, like accidentally clicking on a malicious link in an email. Having the right security tools in place, like antivirus software, helps to defend attack vectors more efficiently and reduce the risk of human error. Last but not least is building a diverse security team. This is one of the best ways to reduce the risk of attack vectors and prevent future attacks. Your own unique perspective can greatly improve a security team's ability to apply an attacker's mindset and stay one step ahead of potential threats. Keeping yourself informed is always important in this field. You're already off to a great start, so keep up the good work. Here we are at the end of this section. Can you believe it? I had so much fun exploring the world of vulnerabilities. I hope you felt the same. And more importantly, I hope you got a better sense of how complex a landscape the digital world is. This environment is filled with gaps that attackers can use to gain unauthorized access to assets, making it a challenge to defend. 
We've explored a lot of information this time around, so let's quickly recap what we've covered. You've learned about the vulnerability management process, starting with the defense and depth model. You learned about the layers of this security framework and how each of them work together to build a stronger defense. You then learned about the CVE list that's used to find cataloged vulnerabilities. This is a great addition to your growing security toolbox. After that, you learned of the attack surfaces that businesses protect. We discussed physical and digital surfaces and the challenges of defending the cloud. We finished up by exploring common attack vectors, where you learned how security teams use an attacker mindset to identify the security gaps that cyber criminals try to exploit. Every one of the vulnerabilities that we've discussed so far is faced with a number of threats. When we get back together, we're going to expand our attacker mindset even further by exploring specific type of attacks that cyber criminals commonly use. We'll look at things like malware and the techniques attackers use to compromise defense systems. By exploring how these tools and tactics work, you'll gain a clearer understanding of the threats they pose. We'll then wrap up by investigating how security teams stop these threats from damaging or organizations' operations, their reputation, and most importantly, their customers and employees. You've done a fantastic job getting to this point. When you're ready, let's finish the journey together. I'm looking forward to being back with you again. Here we are, the final section of the course. What an amazing job you've done so far. Putting in the time, dedication, and hard work to get to this point is definitely something to celebrate. But we're not through yet. As we near the end of this course, now's the time to focus and finish strong. Let's turn our attention to threats. We've already explored assets, vulnerabilities, and the controls used to protect both. A common theme between those two topics has been the wide range of assets and vulnerabilities out there. The world of threats is no different. If you recall, threats are any circumstance or event that can negatively impact assets. In this part of the course, you're going to expand your security mindset by getting a high-level view of the most dangerous threats facing organizations today. First, we're going to begin by exploring social engineering tactics, psychological tricks that attackers use to gain unauthorized access to assets. Next, we'll explore a common type of threat that's been around since the start of personal computers, malware. We're going to spend some time investigating the major types of malware, after that, we'll turn our attention to web-based exploits. Most organizations these days operate in a digital space, and many of them are new to it. In this section of the course, you're going to learn about some of the most common threats that organizations face online. Finally, after exploring common threats that organizations deal with, we're going to wrap up by exploring the threat modeling process. Understanding threats is essential for security analysts, and there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. When you hear the word cybercriminal, what comes to mind? You may imagine a hacker hunched over a computer in a dark room. If this is what came to mind, you're not alone. In fact, this is what most people outside of security think of. But online criminals aren't always that different from those operating in the real world. Malicious hackers are just one type of online criminal. They are a specific kind that relies on sophisticated computer programming skills to pull off their attacks. There are other ways to commit crimes that don't require programming skills. Sometimes, criminals rely on a more traditional approach, manipulation. Social engineering is a manipulation technique that exploits human error to gain private information, access, or valuables. These tactics trick people into breaking normal security procedures on the attacker's behalf. This can lead to data exposures, widespread malware infections, or unauthorized access to restricted systems. Social engineering attacks can happen anywhere. They happen online, in person, and through other interactions. Threat actors use many different tactics to carry out their attacks. Some attacks can take a matter of seconds to perform. For example, someone impersonating tech support asks an employee for their password to fix their computer. Other attacks can take months or longer, such as threat actors monitoring an employee's social media. The employee might post a comment saying they've gotten a temporary position in a new role at the company. An attacker might use an opportunity like this to target the temporary worker. 
who is likely to be less knowledgeable about security procedures. Regardless of the time frame, knowing what to look for can help you quickly identify and stop an attack in its tracks. There are multiple stages of social engineering attacks. The first is usually to prepare. At this stage, attackers gather information about their target. Using the intel, they'll determine the best way to exploit them. In the next stage, attackers establish trust. This is often referred to as pretexting. Here, attackers use the information they gather earlier to open a line of communication. They'll typically disguise themselves to trick their target into a false sense of trust. After that, attackers use persuasion tactics. This stage is where the earlier preparation really matters. This is when the attacker manipulates their target into volunteering information. Sometimes they do this by using specific vocabulary that makes them sound like a member of the organization. The final stage of the process is to disconnect from the target. After they collect the information they want, attackers break communication with their target. They disappear to cover their tracks. Criminals who use social engineering are stealthy. The digital world has expanded their capabilities. It's also created more ways for them to go unnoticed. Still, there are ways that we can prevent their attacks. Implementing managerial controls like policies, standards, and procedures are one of the first lines of defense. For example, businesses often follow the patch management standard defined in NIST Special Publication 800-40. These standards are used to create procedures for updating operating systems, applications, and firmware that can be exploited. Staying informed of trends is also a major priority for any security professional. An even better defense against social engineering attacks is sharing what you know with others. Attackers play on our natural curiosity and desire to help one another. Their hope is that targets won't think too hard about what's going on. Teaching the signs of attack to others goes a long way towards preventing threats. Social engineering is a threat to the assets and privacy of both individuals and organizations. Malicious attackers use a variety of tactics to confuse and manipulate their targets. When we get back together next time, we're going to explore one of the most commonly used techniques that's a major problem for organizations of all sizes. Cybercriminals prefer attacks that do the most amount of damage with the least amount of effort. One of the most popular forms of social engineering that meets this description is phishing. Phishing is the use of digital communications to trick people into revealing sensitive data or deploying malicious software. Phishing leverages many communication technologies, but the term is mainly used to describe attacks that arrive by email. Phishing attacks don't just affect individuals. They are also harmful to organizations. A single employee that falls for one of these tricks can give malicious attackers access to systems. Once inside, attackers can exploit sensitive data like customer names and product secrets. Attackers who carry out these attacks commonly use phishing kits. A phishing kit is a collection of software tools needed to launch a phishing campaign. People with little technical background can use one of these kits. Each of the tools inside are designed to avoid detection. As a security professional, you should be aware of the three main tools inside a phishing kit so that you can quickly identify when they're being used and put a stop to it. The first is malicious attachments. These are files that are infected and can cause harm to the organization's systems. Phishing kits also include fake data collection forms. These forms look like legitimate forms, like a survey. Unlike a real survey, they ask for sensitive information that isn't normally asked for in an email. The third resource they include are fraudulent web links. These open to malicious web pages that are designed to look like trusted brands. Unlike actual websites, these fraudulent sites are built to steal information, like login credentials. Cyber criminals can use these tools to launch a phishing attack in many forms. The most common is through malicious emails. However, they can use them in other forms of communication too. Most recently, cyber criminals are using smishing and vishing to trick people into revealing private information. Smishing is the use of text messages to obtain sensitive information or to impersonate a known source. You probably received these type of messages before. Not only are smishing messages annoying to receive, they're also difficult to prevent. That's why some attackers send them. Some smishing messages are easy to detect. 
They might show signs of being malicious, like promising a cash reward for clicking an attached link that shouldn't be clicked. Other times, smishing is hard to spot. Attackers sometimes use local area codes to appear legitimate. Some hackers can even send messages disguised as friends and families of their target to fool them into disclosing sensitive information. Vishing is the exploitation of electronic voice communication to obtain sensitive information or impersonate a known source. During vishing attacks, criminals pretend to be someone they're not. For example, attackers might call pretending to be a company representative. They might claim that there's a problem with your account, and they can offer to fix it if you provide them with sensitive information. Most organizations use a few basic security measures to prevent these and any other types of phishing attacks from becoming a problem. For example, anti-phishing policies spread awareness and encourage users to follow data security procedures correctly. Employee training resources also help inform employees about things to look for when an email looks suspicious. Another line of defense against phishing is securing email inboxes. Email filters are commonly used to keep harmful messages from reaching users. For example, specific email addresses can be blocked using a block list. Organizations often use other filters, like allow lists, to specify IP addresses that are approved to send mail within the company. Organizations also use intrusion prevention systems to look for unusual patterns in email traffic. Security analysts use monitoring tools like this to spot suspicious emails, quarantine them, and produce a log of events. Phishing campaigns are popular and dangerous forms of social engineering that organizations of all sizes need to deal with. Just a single compromised password that an attacker can get their hands on can lead to a costly data breach. Now that you're familiar with the tools these attackers use, you're better equipped to spot phishing and prevent it. People and computers are very different from one another. There is one way that we're alike. You know how? We're both vulnerable to getting an infection. While humans can be infected by a virus that causes a cold or flu, Computers can be affected by malware. Malware is software designed to harm devices or networks. Malware, which is short for malicious software, can be spread in many ways. For example, it could be spread through an affected USB drive, or also commonly spread between computers online. Devices and systems that are connected to the internet are especially vulnerable to infection. When a device becomes infected, Malware interferes with its normal operations. Attackers use malware to take control of the infected system without the user's knowledge or permission. Malware has been a threat to people and organizations for a long time. Attackers have created many different strains of malware. They all vary in how they're spread. Five of the most common types of malware are a virus, worm, trojan, ransomware, and spyware. Let's take a look at how each of them work. A virus is malicious code written to interfere with computer operations and cause damage to data and software. Viruses typically hide inside of trusted applications. When the infected program is launched, the virus clones itself and spreads to other files on the device. An important characteristic of viruses is that they have to be activated by the user to start the infection. The next kind of malware doesn't have this limitation. A worm is malware that can duplicate and spread itself across systems on its own. While viruses require users to perform an action like opening a file to duplicate, worms use an affected device as a host. They scan the connected network for other devices. Worms then infect everything on the network without requiring an action to trigger the spread. Viruses and worms are delivered through phishing emails and other methods before they infect a device. Making sure you click links only from trusted sources is one way to avoid these types of infection. However, attackers have designed another form of malware that can get past this precaution. A Trojan, or Trojan horse, is malware that looks like a legitimate file or program. The name is a reference to an ancient Greek legend that's set in the city of Troy. In Troy, a group of soldiers hid inside a giant wooden horse that was presented as a gift to their enemies. It was accepted and brought inside the city walls. Later that evening, the soldiers inside the horse climbed out and attacked the city. Like this ancient tale, attackers designed Trojans to appear harmless. 
This type of malware is typically disguised as files or useful applications to trick their target into installing them. Attackers often use Trojans to gain access and install another kind of malware called ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malicious attack where attackers encrypt an organization's data and demand payment to restore access. These kind of attacks have become very common these days. A unique feature of ransomware attacks is that they make themselves known to their targets. Without doing this, they couldn't collect the money they demand. Normally, they decrypt the hidden data as soon as the sum of money is paid. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee they won't return to demand more. The last type of malware I want to mention is spyware. Spyware is malware that's used to gather and sell information without consent. Consent is a key word in this case. Organizations also collect information about their customers, like their browsing habits and purchase history. However, they always give their customers the ability to opt out. Cyber criminals, on the other hand, use spyware to steal information. They use spyware attacks to collect data like login credentials, account pins, and other types of sensitive information for their own personal gain. There are many other types of malware besides these, and new forms are always evolving. They all pose a serious risk to individuals and organizations. Next time, we'll explore how security teams detect and remove these kinds of threats. Malware has been around nearly as long as computers. In its earliest forms, it was used by troublemakers as a form of digital vandalism. In today's digital world, malware has become a profitable crime that attackers use for their own financial gain. As a security professional, it's important that you remain aware of the latest evolutions. Let's take a closer look at one way malware has evolved. We'll then use this example to consider how malware can be spotted and how you can proactively protect against malware. Ransomware is one of the types of malware attackers use to steal money. Another and more recent type of malware is cryptojacking. Cryptojacking is a form of malware that installs software to illegally mine cryptocurrencies. You may be familiar with cryptocurrency from the news. If you're new to the topic, cryptocurrencies are a form of digital money that have real world value. Like physical forms of currency, there are many different types. For the most part, they're referred to as coins or tokens. In simple terms, crypto mining is a process used to obtain new coins. Crypto mining is similar to the process for mining for other resources, like gold. Mining for something like gold involves machinery, such as trucks and bulldozers, that can dig through the earth. Crypto coins, on the other hand, use computers instead. Rather than digging through the earth, the computers run software that dig through billions of lines of encrypted code. When enough code is processed, a crypto coin can be found. Generally, more computers mining for coins mean more cryptocurrency can be discovered. Criminals unfortunately figured this out. Beginning in 2017, crypto jacking malware started being used to gain unauthorized control of personal computers to mine cryptocurrency. Since that time, crypto jacking techniques have become more sophisticated. Criminals now regularly target vulnerable servers to spread their mining software. Devices that communicate with the infected server become infected themselves. The malicious code then runs in the background, mining for coins unknown to anyone. Crypto jacking software is hard to detect. Luckily, security professionals have sophisticated tools that can help. An intrusion detection system, or IDS, is an application that monitors system activity and alerts on possible intrusions. When abnormal activity is detected, like malware mining for coins, the IDS alerts security personnel. Despite their usefulness, detection systems have a major drawback. New forms of malware can remain undetected. Fortunately, there are subtle signs that indicate a device is infected with cryptojacking software or other forms of malware. By far the most telling sign of a cryptojacking infection is slowdown. Other signs include increased CPU usage, sudden system crashes, and fast draining batteries. Another sign is unusually high electricity costs related to the resource intensive process of crypto mining. It's also good to know that there are certain measures you can take to reduce the likelihood of experiencing a malware attack like cryptojacking. These defenses include things like using browser extensions designed to block malware, using ad blockers, 
disabling JavaScript, and staying alert on the latest trends. Security analysts can also educate others in their organizations on malware attacks. While cryptojacking is still relatively new, attacks are becoming more common. The type of malicious code cybercriminals spread is continually evolving. It takes many years of experience to analyze new forms of malware. Nevertheless, you're well on your way towards helping defend against these threats. Previously, we explored a few types of malware. Whether it's installed on an individual computer or a network server, all malicious software needs to be delivered to the target before it can work. Phishing and other social engineering techniques are common ways for malware to be delivered. Another way it's spread is using a broad class of threats known as web-based exploits. Web-based exploits are malicious code or behavior that's used to take advantage of coding flaws in a web application. Cybercriminals target web-based exploits to obtain sensitive personal information. Attacks occur because web applications interact with multiple users across multiple networks. Malicious hackers commonly exploit this high level of interaction using injection attacks. An injection attack is malicious code inserted into a vulnerable application. The infected application often appears to work normally. That's because the injected code runs in the background, unknown to the user. Applications are vulnerable to injection attacks because they are programmed to receive data inputs. This could be something the user types, clicks, or something one program is sharing with another. When coded correctly, applications should be able to interpret and handle user inputs. For example, let's say an application is expecting the user to enter a phone number. This application should validate the input from the user to make sure the data is all numbers and not more than 10 digits. If the input from the user doesn't meet these requirements, the application should know how to handle it. In programming, this is known as input sanitization. Input sanitization is programming that validates inputs from users and other programs. Injection attacks mainly affect applications that fail to sanitize inputs. Because of this, Web applications are one of the most vulnerable targets for injection attacks. Web apps interact with multiple users across many platforms. They also have a lot of interactive objects, like images and buttons. This makes it challenging for developers to think of all the ways they should sanitize their input. A common and dangerous type of injection attack that's a threat to web apps is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting, or XSS, is an injection attack that inserts code into a vulnerable website or web application. These attacks are often delivered by exploiting the two languages used by most websites, HTML and JavaScript. Both can give cybercriminals access to everything that loads on the infected web page. This can include session cookies, geolocation, and even webcams and microphones. There are three main types of cross-site scripting attacks, reflected, stored, and DOM-based. A reflected XSS attack is an instance where a malicious script is sent to the server and activated during the server's response. A common example of this is the search bar of a website. In a reflected XSS attack, criminals send their target a web link that appears to go to a trusted site. When they click the link, it sends a HTTP request to the vulnerable site server. The attacker's script is then returned or reflected back to the innocent user's browser. Here, the browser loads the malicious script because it trusts the server's response. With the script loaded, information like session cookies are sent back to the attacker. In a stored XSS attack, the malicious script isn't hidden in a link that needs to be sent to the server. Instead, a stored XSS attack is an instance when malicious script is injected directly on the server. Here, attackers target elements of a site that are served to the user. This could be things like images and buttons that load when the site is visited. Infected elements activate the malicious code when a user simply visits the site. Stored XSS attacks can be damaging because the user has no way of knowing the site is infected beforehand. Finally, there's DOM-based XSS. DOM stands for Document Object Model, which is basically the source code of a website. A DOM-based XSS attack is an instance when malicious script exists in the web page a browser loads. 
Unlike reflective XSS, these attacks don't need to be sent to the server to activate. In a DOM-based attack, a malicious script can be seen in the URL. In this example, the website's URL contains parameter values. The parameter values reflect input from the user. Here, the site allows users to select color themes. When the user makes a selection, it appears as part of the URL. In a DOM-based attack, criminals change the parameter that's suspecting an input. For example, they could hide malicious JavaScript in the HTML tags. The browser would process the HTML and execute the JavaScript. Hackers use these methods of cross-site scripting to steal sensitive information. Security analysts should be familiar with this group of injection attacks. However, they're not the only ones, as we'll discover next time. Let's keep exploring injection attacks by investigating another common type of web-based exploit. The next one we're going to discuss exploits the way websites access information from databases. Early in the program, you may have learned about SQL. You may recall SQL is a programming language used to create, interact with, and request information from a database. SQL is used by most web applications. For example, shopping websites use it a lot. Imagine the databases of an online clothing store it likely contains a full inventory of all the items the company sells. Websites don't normally make users enter the SQL queries manually. Instead, they use things like menus, images, and buttons to show users information in a meaningful way. For example, when an online shopper clicks a button to add a sweater to their cart, it triggers a SQL query. The query runs in the background where no one can see it. You'll never know from using the menus and buttons of a website, but sometimes those backend queries are vulnerable to injection attacks. A SQL injection is an attack that executes unexpected queries on a database. Like cross-site scripting, SQL injection occurs due to the lack of sanitized input. The injections take place in an area of the website that are designed to accept user input. A common example is the login form to access a site. One of these forms might trigger a backend SQL statement like this when a user enters their credentials. Web forms, like this one, are designed to copy user input into the statement exactly as they're written. The statement then sends a request to the server, which runs the query. Websites that are vulnerable to SQL injection inserts the user input exactly as it's entered before running the code. Unfortunately, this is a serious design flaw. It commonly happens because web developers expect people to use their inputs correctly. They don't anticipate attackers exploiting them. For example, an attacker might insert additional SQL code. This could cause the server to run a harmful query of code that wasn't expecting. Malicious hackers can target these attack vectors to obtain sensitive information, modify tables, and even gain administrative rights to the database. The best way to defend against SQL injections is code that will sanitize the input. Developers can write code to search for specific SQL characters. This gives the server a clearer idea of what inputs to expect. One way this is done is with prepared statements. A prepared statement is a coding technique that executes SQL statements before passing them into the database. When the user input is unknown, the best practice is to use these prepared statements. With just a few extra lines of code, a prepared statement executes the code before passing it onto the server. This means the code can be validated before performing the query. Having well-written code is one of the keys to preventing SQL injection. Security teams work with program developers to test applications for these sort of vulnerabilities. Like a lot of security tasks, it's a team effort. Injection attacks are just one of many types of web-based exploits that security teams deal with. We're going to explore how security teams prepare for injection attacks and other kinds of threats. Preparing for attacks is an important job that the entire security team is responsible for. Threat actors have many tools they can use depending on their target. For example, 
Attacking a small business can be different from attacking a public utility. Each have different assets and specific defenses to keep them safe. In all cases, anticipating attacks is the key to preparing for them. In security, we do that by performing an activity known as threat modeling. Threat modeling is the process of identifying assets, their vulnerabilities, and how each is exposed to threats. We apply threat modeling to everything we protect. Entire systems, applications, or business processes all get examined from this security-related perspective. Creating threat models is a lengthy and detailed activity. They are normally performed by a collection of individuals with years of experience in the field. Because of that, it's considered to be an advanced skill in security. However, that doesn't mean you won't be involved. There are several threat modeling frameworks used in the field. Some are better suited for network security. Others are better for things like information security or application development. In general, there are six steps of a threat model. The first is to define the scope of the model. At this stage, the team determines what they're building by creating an inventory of assets and classifying them. The second step is to identify threats. Here, the team defines all potential threat actors. A threat actor is any person or group who presents a security risk. Threat actors are characterized as being internal or external. For example, an internal threat actor could be an employee who intentionally exposed an asset to harm. An example of an external threat actor could be a malicious hacker or a competing business. After threat actors have been identified, the team puts together what's known as an attack tree. An attack tree is a diagram that maps threats to assets. The team tries to be as detailed as possible when constructing this diagram before moving on. Step three of the threat modeling process is to characterize the environment. Here, the team applies an attacker mindset to the business. They consider how the customers and employees interact with the environment. Other factors they consider are external partners and third-party vendors. At step four, their objective is to analyze threats. Here, the team works together to examine existing protections and identify gaps. They then rank threats according to their risk score that they assign. During step five, the team decides how to mitigate risks. At this point, the group creates their plan for defending against threats. The choices here are to avoid risks, transfer it, reduce it, or accept it. The sixth and final step is to evaluate findings. At this stage, everything that was done during the exercise is documented. Fixes are applied and the team makes note of any successes they had. They also record any lessons learned so they can inform how they approach future threat models. That's an overview of the general threat modeling process. What we explored was just one of many methods that exist. Let's finish exploring threat modeling by taking a look at real world scenarios. This time, we'll use a standard threat modeling process called PASTA. Imagine that a fitness company is getting ready to launch their first mobile app. Before we can go live, the company asks their security team to ensure the app will protect customer data. The team decides to perform a threat model using the PASTA framework. PASTA is a popular threat modeling framework that's used across many industries. PASTA is short for Process for Attack Simulation and Threat Analysis. There are seven stages of the PASTA framework. Let's go through each of them to help this fitness company get their app ready. Stage one of the PASTA threat model framework is to define business and security objectives. Before starting the threat model, the team needs to decide what their goals are. The main objective in our example with the fitness company app is protecting customer data. The team starts by asking a lot of questions at this stage. They'll need to understand things like how personally identifiable information is handled. Answering these questions is a key to evaluating the impact of threats that they'll find along the way. Stage two of the PASTA framework is to define the technical scope. Here the team's focus is to identify the application components that must be evaluated. This is what we discussed earlier as the attack surface. For a mobile app, this will include technology that's involved while data is at rest and in use. This includes network protocols, security controls, and other data interactions. At stage three of PASTA, the team's job is to decompose the application. In other words, 
we need to identify the existing controls that would protect user data from threats. This normally means working with the application developers to produce a data flow diagram. A diagram like this would show how data gets from a user's device to the company's database. It would also identify the controls in place to protect this data along the way. Stage four pasta is next. The focus here is to perform a threat analysis. This is where the team gets into their attacker mindset. Here, research is done to collect the most up-to-date information on the type of attacks being used. Like other technologies, mobile apps have many attack vectors. These change regularly, so the team would reference resources to stay up to date. Stage five of PASTA is performing a vulnerability analysis. In this stage, the team more deeply investigates potential vulnerabilities by considering the root of the problem. Next is stage six of PASTA, where the team conducts attack modeling. This is where the team tests the vulnerabilities that were analyzed in stage five by simulating attacks. The team does this by creating an attack tree, which looks like a flow chart. For example, an attack tree for our mobile app might look like this. Customer information like usernames and passwords is a target. This data is normally stored in a database. We've learned that databases are vulnerable to attacks like SQL injection. So we will add this attack vector to our attack tree. A threat actor might exploit vulnerabilities caused by unsanitized inputs to attack this vector. The security team uses attack trees like this to identify attack vectors that need to be tested to validate threats. This is just one branch of this attack tree. An application like a fitness app typically has lots of branches with a number of other attack vectors. Stage seven of PASTA is to analyze risk and impact. Here, the team assembles all the information they've collected in stages one through six. By this stage, the team is in position to make informed risk management recommendations to business stakeholders that align with their goals. And with that, we made it all the way through a threat modeling exercise based on the PASTA framework. Managing threats is a major part of what security professionals do. In this part of the course, we've explored some common types of cyber threats that you will likely encounter in the field. Let's review. We started off discussing social engineering. You learned that attackers have a variety of ways to trick their targets into sharing private information. Social engineering techniques rely on exploiting people's trust and willingness to help. Phishing attacks are one of the most common ways that attackers go about manipulating their targets. Next, we explored malware. Here, we discussed the major classes of malware, like viruses, trojans, and worms. You learned how to spot signs of infection. You also learned how malware has evolved and become more sophisticated over the years. After that, we turned our attention to web-based exploits, specifically injection attacks. You learned about cross-site scripting and SQL injection, two of the most common types of attacks facing organizations online. We discussed how each of these attacks are carried out. You also learned about how web applications can be protected from malicious code. Finally, we explored the threat modeling process. You learned the process that security teams use to perform these exercises. Unfortunately, cyber attacks and security breaches are a reality that we're challenged with on a regular basis. However, being aware of the type of threats that exist and the threat modeling process provides an important foundation for your work as a security analyst. Congratulations on making it through the end of this course. I can hardly believe our time together is over. Before moving on in the certificate program, I'd like to reflect on all the amazing progress you've made. When we started, you were introduced to a wide range of assets organizations protect. Our primary focus was information security, specifically digital information. Here, you learned how asset classification helps security teams focus their efforts and prioritize resources. We explored digital assets and the three states of data. We also learned how policies, standards, and procedures can mitigate organizational risks. Our focus on the NIST cybersecurity framework introduced you to a commonly used framework for managing risks. Afterwards, you learned about fundamental security systems and controls. You got to explore technology like encryption that's used to protect data in all its states. 
You also learned how technologies like public key infrastructure and digital certificates are used to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information online. And you also explored access controls that make up the authentication, authorization, and accounting framework. Next, we explored common vulnerabilities and systems. During this part of the course, you got an inside look into how security teams position themselves ahead of attacks. We explored the defense in depth strategy that's applied to protect information as it's exchanged between parties online. You also learned about the common vulnerability and exposures list, the vulnerability assessment process, and attack surfaces and attack vectors. We then explored the major threats to asset security, like social engineering, malware, and web-based exploits. Together, we discussed how these attacks are carried out and the ways security teams prevent them from doing damage. We then finished up by exploring the process of threat modeling. We covered so much. I really appreciate your effort through it all. When I first started my career in security, my goal was to learn, network, and embrace any opportunity. I was able to attend security conferences, receive job tips, earned references, and volunteer to gain experience. At that time, I would have never imagined that I'd be here teaching what I've learned to others. That just goes to show you, your security journey is only just beginning. While our time together is over, we covered a lot of complex topics, many of which are areas of specialization in security. With the foundation you built here, you have a wide range of possibilities to continue growing in the field. I'm so glad to have played a part in this step along your journey into the world of security, and I wish you all the best as you continue forward along your path.